This is the session on building Power BI connectors. I hope everyone had a good lunch. Feeling awake? Because we're going to go through some good stuff pretty fast. Um, how many of you guys have ever cracked open the advanced editor in Power Query to take a look at what exactly is getting generated under the hood? Great. That's, that's actually really nice. OK. Uh, how many of you work for an ISV that would like to get connector out to your customers? Uh, ISV. ISV, yeah. Consultants who maybe you have a third party connector that you'd really like to help another company connect to? And then finally, what about maybe enterprises that have really complex IT internal requirements you'd like to make your life a lot easier to put it all in the same scene? OK, those are usually our three, really three big categories. And uh, especially for the consultants and IT guys, we have some special stuff that maybe you haven't seen it that we've had come out in the last couple months. So my name's Colin Popel. Uh, I handle the Power BI connector certification program. Um, general customer support, partner support, all that stuff. Uh, I work on the M engine and the M language. Uh, this is Matt Masson. Uh, he handles a lot of our SDK stuff, IntelliSense, and uh, he also did the partner management stuff before he shuffled all that off onto me. Um, <laughs> I love you all so very much, but I get a lot of emails. So uh, we're going to be uh, kind of Broad, broadly speaking, Matt's going to be going over uh, the tech behind custom connectors, the language, um, and how kind of how data sources and credentials work, and giving demos to show you exactly how you build up these connectors if you've never had the chance to do so. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap it by discussing what are your deployment options and getting it out to customers, how can they use them, and what types of circumstances, um, and going over kind of what we've delivered in the last year and what we're hoping to deliver in the next year. So. What is a Power BI connector? Well, ho hopefully the wording makes it a little bit obvious, but when you go to the get data dialog in uh, Power BI, and to a limited extent when you go to it in um, Excel, there is a list of connectors. Uh, these are different discrete data sources that you can connect to and retrieve data for transforming and loading into Power BI. Um, each entry maps to a data source function, some connectors expose more than one function. Generally, there's one exposed function per connector. Uh, the vast majority by number today are on our custom connector API. Some of them are built in. So there's kind of four major types of connectors in Power BI as a whole. We have our native connectors, which is a lot of our really high touch things. This would be stuff like the SQL connector, the SAP connector, things that engineers on our team are having to do specific engine work to support, um, cube sources. We have bundled connectors that were built by or with partners um, over you know, the 2016-2017 period. Um, this is a lot of big SaaS products, uh, mixed panels, Zendesk, stuff like that. Uh, we have certified connectors, which we started delivering uh, last year. And that would be Denodo, Dremio, uh, OBIEE, uh, BI connector. I think they might be in the audience here somewhere. Um, and uh, stuff like that. And then finally, your local custom connectors. And this last one is stuff that you've developed um, or maybe a vendor has developed for you. It's not distributed through us. It's just generally passed around like a file through a file share email, whatever. So I'm going to turn the stage over to Matt, and he's going to tell you how you go about building these connectors, what's behind them, some of the more advanced topics, and then I'll be back up to talk about kind of where we're going to make your lives easier in the next year. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to go through some content pretty quickly, uh, and I'll try to focus more on the demos and less on the slides. And then near the later part of my presentation, it's going to be mostly reference material uh, you guys can come back to. We don't expect you to take it all in, uh, but we only have an hour session, but I want to get as much uh, information out to you guys as possible. So overview of custom connectors. As Colin mentioned, custom connectors add new data sources to Power BI. Um, we're up to, we're up over, what, 8,000 connectors, well, probably closer to 100, but we have a lot of connectors in Power BI, uh, which I find kind of weird considering you only really need two data sources, uh, SQL and Excel. Like, I don't know why you need anything else. <laughs> But if you have your data in some soon-to-be legacy source like Salesforce, I guess you might want to connect to it. <laughs> Power Query. Uh, so we have this thing called the Power Query SDK for Visual Studio. You can download it from the Extension Marketplace. This is what you use to build 
uh, your custom data connectors for Power BI. And I will show you that process. Um, custom connectors are implemented in M. And M is the language used by Power Query in the Power BI desktop tool. Um, people ask why we do it in M versus anything else, and there's a few different reasons. Uh, one is that it's portable, right? So we want these connectors to run anywhere Power Query runs. So that could be Excel, that could be Power BI Desktop, that can be Power Query Online that you've probably seen. That would be in the gateway so we can refresh on-prem. We want these portable things. The second is that it's sandboxed, right? You're dealing with data, you're dealing with connectivity, you're dealing with credentials. Um, by using M, we have a fully sandbox environment, and you cannot connect to an external source without credentials. Right? That's, that's our whole model, and that's where we get our security out of. Um, and it turns out all the things you need to do to build a data connector, like connecting to a web API, uh, transforming a JSON data into a presentable format, M does pretty well. Um, and even though there's a bit of a learning curve as you're getting, to use, uh, getting used to M, once you're proficient with it, you can crank out a connector pretty quickly. Um, in the initial, when we were first developing the APIs and going through everything, uh, we'd do these hackathons with partners, and at about a half hour call, we'd be able to get an end-to-end -end working connector uh, for the partner. Actually iterating on it and perfecting it, right, that takes a lot of time, but just connecting to data is pretty straightforward, and that is what I'm gonna focus on today. So you, I said the connectors are written in M, and you're basically, what you do is you wrap an existing data source function. And so the three main data source functions you'd use are web.contents to connect to a REST API, um, odata.feed to connect to an odata service. You'll hear me talk about odata a lot. Um, I was, uh, I don't know if you know about odata, but odata was an effort to standardize data access. I'll talk about the pros and cons of that and why we really like odata when it comes to connectivity. Um, and I'm finally, um, using an existing ODBC driver uh, is another great way to create a custom connector using the ODBC data source function. I'll talk about that uh, near the end of my section. The custom data connectors today work in Power BI Desktop as well as the Power BI service. Great, so what can you do with the custom data connector? Of course, the main purpose is to connect to a new data source um, to connect to a custom data source or something that we haven't shipped out of the box for various reasons. Most common use of uh, custom data connectors, I think the vast majority of connectors we've shipped in the last little while are connectors over REST APIs. Uh, REST APIs are not analyst friendly. REST APIs are written with the assumption that the developer is sitting with the documentation page open and seeing which parameters they can call and what they can do to get back data um, as a generic query tool that is not useful, right? So what uh, you do with a custom data connector over a REST API is normalize the data in a way that the analyst can interact with it normally. Um, implementing OAuth solutions. So in OAuth, um, it's when you get that pop-up dialog that says enter your credentials, um, and the whole mechanism is security related. Uh, it means that the remote site, the site you're authenticating with, gets your username and password. The application only gets this token. And it's great security-wise, it is a pain to use because it is not, uh, there's an OAuth standard, but the standard is open to interpretation. And there's slight differences between every single OAuth implementation that make it very difficult to do generically. So one of the other common uses of a custom data connector is to implement an OAuth flow so Power Query can authenticate normally, like with any of the other built-in sources. Um, using it as a, a building block for a Power BI app, a Power BI template app, uh, so users can just instantiate your app from powerbi.com, from app source, consume the app, um, usually if you can't connect to your data source directly from Power Query out of the box, it requires creating a custom connector. You work with Microsoft to deploy that to our cloud service, and that is how you build these apps. Enabling direct query for ODBC-based sources. Uh, so you, while it's technically possible to create a direct query connector purely in M, I never recommend it. It is extremely complex at this point. Uh, we're still working on the tooling. But you can create a direct query connector over ODBC drivers. And actually, the, the um, vast majority, say 95% of the direct query connectors we've released in the last two years, all take this approach. And of course, you can just do it to impress your friends. Um, sorry, if you've seen this, ses this session before or parts of the session, uh, I have brand new connectors I'm creating, but it is the same jokes I'm recycling, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> so what goes into a custom connector? You have branding and discoverability, right? So rather than uh, telling the user, okay, open up OData, paste in this URL, uh, you actually get an icon and a name in the get data dialog. You are searchable, you are findable, so you get branding for your data source. 
you get connection parameters. So you can define um, what the user has to specify to connect to your data source. It could be a server name, could be a URL address. You could have uh, advanced settings where you know, booleans and max ranges and things like that. And of course, the simplest connector doesn't prompt at all. It just asks you for credentials and you connect. Um, you wanna make your connectivity experience as simple as possible for a user. And that's really one of the uh, methodologies that Power Query is championing from the beginning. Authentication, you get to supply, uh, get to define what authentication, what uh, credential types your data source supplies. This could be multiple. If you connect to web, for example, five different authentication options show up. Um, generally, a data source may have one or two different API mechanisms, but we support all the most common ones out of the box. Schema navigation. So this is what we call internally, we call a nav table, a navigation table over your data source. So rather than just seeing flat data um, or having user browse through web-based um, URLs, you get to format your data in a nice navigation table format. A uh, user can go and browse, you can build a hierarchy, you can expand, uh, right? You'll notice that we've normalized, Power Query normalizes access over data sources to provide a consistent experience, and the nav table plays a big part of that. And finally, data retrieval. Once the user selects the data they want, your connector has the logic to go and retrieve that data for the user and format it in a nice way. Now, I've been using the um, common data service connector as an example all throughout. So this is a connector that we ship out of the box with Power BI Desktop, but it's built using the same mechanism and same APIs that you use through the custom connector SDK. Great, let me jump over to creating a very simple connector. Did not see that. So great, um, the connector I'm going to create is for the TripIn service. TripIn is an OData API. Um, OData, as I had mentioned earlier, was an effort, it's an industry standard to um, standardize the way you bring data back. It has two key parts to it. It has metadata, so you get to describe your service, and it has a standard way of retrieving data. If you've ever tried to connect to a REST API in Power BI and found that the API pages data, you have to write all this custom logic to do paging, versus OData, it's all standardized. You just connect and it all just works. And I'll show that as creating the connector. So here I am in Visual Studio. I've already installed the, the Power Query SDK extension from the marketplace. I'm gonna create a new project. Data connector project, I'll call it Trippin. So today for Visual Studio, we support 2015, 2017. We are currently working on 2019 support. You can stop with the angry comments on our GitHub. We know we need to do 2019 support. Um, we're getting there. Okay, so when I generate a new connector, I have two files. I have my actual connector logic, and I have a query file that lets me run and test my queries from within Visual Studio. What you get as your standard template is just a quick hello world. You can enter a message and it will display, uh, it will echo back your message to you. Um, I am just going to do a really simple implementation where I call odata.feed. I'm gonna go back to my web page, take the URL, whoops, paste that in, and great. That's all I'm gonna do. I'll walk through what this code actually means in a later slide. But for now, that's basically my whole connector. I have now have this function called trippin.contents, and when it's run, it is going to call odata.feed with a fixed URL. I'm gonna build. That is going to open, that is gonna create what's called a mez file. So I see I have trippin.mez. A mez file is just basically a zip of your project. I'm gonna copy that to my custom connectors directory. That's created by default when you install Power BI Desktop. There'll be your My Documents, Power, uh, Power BI Desktop Custom Connectors. So I just copy that file in there. And then without even to have restart Power BI Desktop, when I click Get Data and type in Trippin or Trip, Trip, it doesn't show up. Now, why would that be? Let's try this again. It still doesn't show up. Now, why would that be? 
I might need to enable, I should already have uh, custom connectors already uh, enabled. And there shouldn't be anything wrong. I could, so let's just check to see if this connector is working. I can run it in Visual Studio. Oh, that's the problem. Whoops, it failed to load. Now why did my connector fail to load? Trip in, odeager.contents. No. Um, that's a great question. I should be online. I was online a second ago. Let's try to refresh this. Yeah, that should be working. Let's try this again. So let's get rid of my existing chip and mess. Thankfully, I created a backup where I already have a pre-created connector. Let's just use this one that I know works. And I'll figure out why that didn't load after. So now when I click get data, so now when I click get data, I have my trip in connector that I created. And I will select it. I get a prompt warning me that it's a third party data service. Um, and now what it's doing is it's connected to that OData service that I connected to. It reads its schema. It displays me a nice navigation table. I can select data and I get a nice preview. I can bring that up, edit it. And that was basically with just one line of code, right? So what, that, what that's doing is using the existing odata.feed function that we have built into the M engine and wrapping it. You're basically just adding branding and you're telling how to authenticate and it all just works, right? We just, uh, everything in M composes together nicely. And I'll show how, um, yeah, I'll show how some of the functionality like filters and stuff will automatically flow down as well. So that's a really simple connector. Hopefully I can figure out why that didn't work the first time. But let's switch back slides. Let me talk a bit about M and what we just saw there. So if you've seen Power Query before, you know that there's a procedural way of connect to data, you select the table you want, and then you start doing transformations, right? A step-by-step -step transformation. And it will give you code that looks something like this, where you have your source, connect to your source, your second line is I've indexed into the source to pick a specific table from that web page, and then finally I'm doing a rename columns and you see like source is used on the second line and then web table is used on the third line. And then finally, my last statement, uh, my last part of my let statement is the in. I say in, we're named columns. The in is basically an out. You're, return, you're basically saying return the value of renamed columns. So you see there's a flow step by step and you're doing the different transformations. The main difference when you're writing custom connectors is that you don't have to follow that step-by-step -step flow. What you'll find yourself doing is reusing variables, right? So all the names on the left, they're called steps in the UI. They're essentially variables. And so you're defining these things and assigning them to the variables and then reusing them. So in this bottom example here, um, bottom example here, I've connected to source and then I reuse that source three times. So I connect to a database, for example, and I pull out uh, product category, subcategory, and customer, assign them all as variables. Then I only use two of those variables, category and subcategory, and do a join. M is a dynamic, lazy language. So when it actually does this evaluation, because dim customer is never actually referenced, it would just be stripped out of the execution tree entirely. That's what I mean when I say M is lazy. Uh, M won't eagerly pull values until you ask for it, until you absolutely have to do it which can be a bit frustrating while developing. Um, sometimes it leads to very obscure errors, uh, but it, it can lead to better efficiency when you're actually invoking and things work as expected. So I say things flow from step to step to step. Um, that is actually the exact opposite of how it works, but it's easy to say conceptually. What actually happens is the evaluation starts from the end and works its way backwards. So when the engine sees this, it says, okay, I need the result of joined. And to calculate joined, I have to calculate subcat and cat. And to calculate those two things, I need to connect to the source and the specific tables. So it actually works backwards, right? And so as you see, because dim customer was never actually referenced, it would never be touched. 
Um, this is important for custom connector developers because when you want to insert trace information and all you have is a trace line, you're wondering why you'll never see that trace line because it never actually gets evaluated. So this format we call the M expression format. Um, and this is what you'll see in Power Query. When you create a single query, you get an M expression. Data connectors use a slightly different format. It's called a section document format. And a section document format contains one or more M expressions. And so in Power BI Desktop, if you go to click Diagnostics and it gives you a bunch of system information, uh, you'll actually see all of the queries that are contained within your workbook. And you'll see that that's actually in section document format as well. So this is similar to the connector I just created. It starts off with a section header at the beginning, and this is where you're declaring your, the name of your module. By convention, this is generally the same name as your data source kind. You define this thing called the data source kind, um, and what this basically tells the engine is that the next function is a data source function, and that means that to run that function, you need a credential, a, a trip-in credential. Right? I've declared that this is data source kind trip-in, to run this function, I need that credential before I can connect. And the value trip in relates to this record of trip in down here. The trip in is my actual record with my data source definition. In this case, all I'm saying is that the authentication type it supports is anonymous. Right? So when I got a prompt, it says anonymous off, I just click connect. But anonymous is still a type of credential. And you can have multiple credential types here as well. The other special thing on the data source record is this publish thing. Now what publish says is register this particular data source in the get data dialog. You can, your connector can expose multiple functions as we mentioned before. Generally you only expose a single top level function and that's the one you say publish and that's what will show up in, the, in, in get data. And then the record down here defines um, you know, the text to use on the button, the tooltip text, is it a beta connector, help links, the category, things like that. Another special keyword that you don't see in regular Power Query usage is shared, that shared identifier. Shared is like an export, right? So you're basically saying, um, expose this function, tripin.feed, to the outside world, to, to Power Query. When Power Query consumes this, this is the one function that you can see, where you can have multiple shared members. And then you have internal members. So for example, in this particular connector, I have tripin.feed that's using the tripin implementation. And Trippin implementation is an internal, internal member that is only available within the scope of this file. Okay, so that's basically the format of the custom connectors. Other M concept I wanted to talk about is query folding. So this is an important concept in Power Query in general, and it's one of the main power, powerful features of Power Query. So in this example, I have a query where I am connecting to a database, and I've done a bunch of transformations. So in this case, I'm going to uh, select certain columns. I'm going to rename a column. I'm going to add a filter, so product key is less than 10, and then I'm going to sort. Right? So in the UI, I've done all these steps. Power Query has generated this, this set of transformations. When this gets evaluated by our engine, by the Power Query engine, also called the M engine, um, it will collapse, or what we call query folding, fold all of these statements into a single SQL statement and push it to the backend source. Um, and we can do this for many different languages. And your connector can automatically inherit this functionality as well. Part of the magic of Power Query is what we call partial folding and compensation. So if you are doing an operation that can't be pushed to the source or fully pushed to the source, we'll push what we can and do the rest of the stuff locally. Right? So for some sources, like SharePoint, if you're connected to a SharePoint list, uh, SharePoint lists only support simple filters. So I can, do, I can push that product key filter, but the rename and the sort I have to do locally. Right? So it will do that. If you connect to a data source that has no functionality, like Excel or CSV, there's, there's no engine you can push to, it will do everything locally. Right? So your connector, well, next slide, um, what we actually fold, we can do a lot of different things. So column filters, row filters, aggregates, group buys, um, pivot, unpivot. The actual functionality is we're not limited to SQL. We can do other things, cubes, OData, Active Directory, basically anything with its own query language. Um, even pushing to REST APIs is possible. So why does this matter for a, for a custom connector developer? Um, by, it matters because of the function that you pick uh, to use as your base implementation. 
So for example, if you wrap an ODBC driver, you get a lot of inherent uh, capabilities all built in. We really like ODBC because ODBC has this contract where you can ask the driver, what level of SQL do you support? Do you support subselects? Do you support group buys? Which aggregates do you support? And we can ask all these questions to the driver so we know the set of ANSI SQL that we can send to it. Um, and just by wrapping your driver, you, your connector automatically gets all that functionality. Same with OData. OData has a metadata document. It has a standard way of providing filters. Uh, just by wrapping OData, you get that functionality as well. Things like regular web connectivity, ADO.net, OLADB, don't have those APIs, don't have that discoverability. So you're basically limited to retrieving all the data and everything that's done locally. Uh, there are options to implement your own custom folding logic uh, within your connector with a special function called table.view. I'm not gonna go into that in this session, uh, but there are some samples online that talk about uh, how to use that in basic ways, like folding uh, top or limit statements and basic filters. Great. So let's go back to demo number two. And we will create a new connector. So one of the last times I did this session, um, I connected to my game, uh, to a Steam game platform, Steam API, and I thought I was being very clever, um, funny. Uh, and then I met some people in the audience who were, wanted to create some connector to connect to a database that helps them um, analyze AIDS funding for, to help children with AIDS. And it made me feel very shallow. Um, so <laughs> I decided to build something a bit more uh, useful. NASA has a bunch of APIs. This is the Fireball API. It tracks all the different Fireball impacts of meteorites and stuff in the atmosphere. Um, so you can look at this and be scared. Um, so <laughs> this sample is available on GitHub too. What I'm gonna do is uh, show a couple of different things about how to create it. So again, it's a REST API. It's written with the assumption that the developer is sitting right in front of the API and looking at the query parameters and knows exactly what to put in. Sorry if that's a bit, a bit faded out. Um, but the main thing we care about here is this HTTP request, the actual URL that we're going, going to connect to. So I've created a partial connector here already. Um, you see I'm calling it Fireball, uh, my base URL. My implementation is pretty simple. I'm going to connect to that base URL and parse the results as a JSON document. If I go back to the documentation page, if I can find it, this is an example of the data that we get back from the API. Um, so we see it's structured uh, interestingly. So it has this header stuff, it has a count. It has its fields and its data as separate elements, which is a bit of a pain. It means I'm gonna do, have to do some transformations uh, to get it into the shape I want. Um, so I have fields as one thing, and then I have datas, which is, data, which is gonna be a list of list values. So I'm gonna have, yeah, I'm gonna have to do some transformations. Now, I, because I've been working in M for a few years, I could do all that by hand, um, but we don't have time for that. So let's do what I generally do and actually use Power Query. So in the future, fullness of time, imagine our SDK has a built-in Power Query experience, and I do this really raw uh, data connector that just brings back the JSON, and then I can launch Power Query and start transforming and get it into the shape I want and click save and now I have a connector. That's our end vision. Right now, this is a bit more manual. So what I need to do is I'm gonna copy my connector over to my Power BI desktop directory and use Power BI to do the rest of, uh, to, do the, to do those transformations. So great, I'll copy this over. I have Fireball, let's launch Power BI again. I've even, even added a custom icon for Fireball. Um, let's load that up. And I click get data. Fireball is there. Great. I zoom in, and so what, basically what I'm getting is uh, a parsed version of what I saw on the web, right? I have the signature account and fields, and I need those, that, the, 
fields is going to be my list of column headers, and then I have my list of data. So let's go over to the advanced editor and do a couple of things. First, I am going to save off those things, the, those two things that I wanted. So I'm going to have uh, fields is equal to source uh, fields. And I'm going to have data is equal to source data. And I'll return data for now because I'm going to do some transformations on it. So like I said, I have a list, I have a list of lists, basically. It's easier working in tables in Power Query, so I'll click the two table. Now it's going to give me a single column table with a bunch of lists as records. And I'll do my favorite transformation, the add custom column. Um, and we have a handy function called record from list. Use column one. And I will use fields, which is that variable I saved before that has all the column headers. So my expression is basically here saying for every list value, which is going to be all of our values that we want, turn it into a record. So it's actually going to be named. And what I'll end up with is a record column rather than a list column. Then I can expand. Actually, let me do that again. Because I'm going to take off the header name. Get rid of my original list. And now I have data in a shape that I can better use it. Um, now, because this is a JSON API, there's no implicit type information that comes back. Everything's just going to be typed any, uh, which isn't great for BI purposes. Power Query also has this really handy detect data type thing, which I can select on my columns, click detect data types, and it will assign types for me. Right, so now you see I have the date icon, and I have the number icons, and things like that. And this becomes a much more useful data connector. Now, once I have all that code, I have the data in the shape that I want. I can simply copy and paste this code back over to Visual Studio and bundle it up as a connector. So let me do the cooking show magic and switch over to another connector. So this is that same connector with those transformation steps that I just did, right? Converting to list, adding the custom column, doing the expand, removing it, getting to the shape I want. I've also added one thing where, according to their API, I can pass in a query parameter uh, that requires a location. Because the report I want to do is to show all the impacts on the global thing. Uh, data without location isn't that interesting to me, so I'm automatically going to filter that out. So I've published this connector to GitHub, by the way, if you want to play with it. One of the things that you can do is, because they have so many different filter parameters available for this API, uh, using our table.view functionality, you can add your own query folding capabilities. I was planning to turn that into a full tutorial, where if in the query editor the user were to say, uh, you know, date greater than X, you could actually capture that and translate that into the date-min parameter on the connector, right? But of course, because there's nothing inherently built into a REST API that lets us know how to do that automatically, you need to code that into the connector yourself. Um, great. So now I have my connector with my transformations. I'm going to build. I am going to open and replace the existing Fireball connector. Um, let's delete this query and start over. Fireball. So there's one thing I wanted to call out. So now, rather than getting the, um, rather than getting that raw JSON record like we had before, now that I've applied the translations and I'm returning a table, I get it back a nicely formatted table. Other thing is, with most connectors, you get back a navigation table, but I didn't code that into my connector. All I'm doing is returning the flat data because, in case of the Fireball API, there's no multiple table things. It's just a flat 
table to return, right? So in that case, there's, there's different, um, different experiences in Power Query, but generally if your connector returns data, you just jump straight into the query editor. Uh, I have all the data that I want. I can say close and apply. And it loads it into the data model. And let's just create a really quick report with it to show that the data can be loaded. I'll do one of these fancy Esri charts. I have a latitude value, longitude value. I have a, let's do color, let's do size, energy, color impact, date, time. Date goes to time. Zoom in a little bit. Great, and I can play to show impacts over time. I think I'm, the full connector would require you mapping the east, west, north, south stuff for that long, but you get the general idea that, right, we can connect to this data source, data source I couldn't connect to before, bring the data in, I can start immediately start building reports against it, right? Great, any questions on that? No, okay. Let's, uh, one more thing I wanted to show quickly, since I think we'll have time. If I go back to that trip in database, trip in, trip in data set, there's a tool called Fiddler. And what Fiddler does is it captures HTTP traffic going out on your machine. When you're developing against the REST API, Fiddler is your best friend. Um, it is definitely helpful um, to see the traffic coming in and going out. So I'm gonna connect to Trippin again, because I wanted to show you a, a real life example of the folding. So for example, I've selected my airlines. I click edit to open up the query editor. Um, and so here I've selected one of my values and I say, I set a filter, I say text equals transformation. Now if I look at the queries that were generated in Trippin, here, let's make that easier. Let me remove all and I will refresh. Preview. Inspector, web forms. I can see that the, the top, I see a top 1,000, even though I didn't insert one, the query editor automatically inserts the top. Because it's OData, we know that an OData service can support top, so we push top down. And I set a filter equals, and that gets automatically pushed down as well. So going back to the folding discussion, um, my main feedback here is that if you have control over your API, if you have this choice, I highly recommend investing in a capable server-side OData API rather than trying to build all of that connectivity and the functionality in the connector layer. My general recommendation is to keep your connector as simple as possible and have a fully functional server. Uh, you'll be able to iterate quicker and it will apply to more scenarios than just the Power BI connectivity scenario. But that's my um, plug, final plug for OData of the session. Okay, quickly back to slides. We'll do a recap of what we just did with the data sources and credentials. And this is more of the reference material stuff. Okay, so going back. What you're doing with the custom data connector is you're defining a new data source, right? And each data source has a function, one or more functions associated with it. Each data source function or each data source kind has a specific type of credential. And each credential has a path associated with it, right? And we use the path to determine what the, it's basically the path is a unique key of connecting to a given data source. So if I connect to SQL Server A, that will have one credential, one credential and SQL Server B will have a different credential. Power Query tries to ca will always cache your credentials and reuse, so it prompts you a minimal number of times. Um, credential matching is also used when you're in the service and you're configuring scheduled refresh. You provide your credentials once for a data source. We remember that you've provided those credentials. If you deploy another report with the same data source, you're not asked a second time. And the advantage there is reusing the credentials, so less prompts for you. But also, if your credentials expire, you update in a single place. You don't have to update every single report, right? But the way that whole mechanism works 
is with the kind, the data source kind, and the data source path. Talk about credential types. So the credential types we support, username and password, that's basic auth, anonymous, windows, key, and OAuth. Um, of these, OAuth is the most complicated because you have to provide callback functions on how to generate the starting URL and how to capture the token and things like that. If you've done anything with OAuth, they'll all look familiar to you. Um, your data source functions that you call inherit the credential um, of your connector. So for example, when I create my tripping connector and I say it supports anonymous auth, and I make a call to web.contents, web.contents inherits that anonymous credential and it just connects. For certain authentication types, this makes total sense. Anonymous, for example, just means we will connect without setting an actual credential. Um, things like Windows make sense too because we know how to impersonate the process and we'll call out. For certain authentication types that don't have a standard, like key-based auth, right? A key might go into the URL, it might go into a header, it might go into multiple places, you might have to hash it, you might have to mine it. There's all kinds of schemes uh, for key-based auth. Your extension will have to get the current credential with extension.currentcredentials, and then you explicitly pass it to your underlying data source function. So for example, if you are connecting to ODBC, you would take the current credential and set the right connection string properties. Uh, Web.contents, you'd set a header, or you'd set a query parameter with the given uh, credential that's been passed in from the user. So data source paths, like I said, are a unique identifier for a given data source. So for example, uh, here I have odata.feed function. odata takes in a URL. Um, so when I provide that credential, that becomes its path. And so if I connect to other things, other URLs, I'll be prompted for new uh, credentials. Credentials take a couple of different formats. So for example, SharePoint will take in a URL format for the credential. Um, SQL, which has multiple connection parameters, has um, a path made up of both server and database. Right? So your data source credentials are, uh, sorry, data source path is generally made up of all the required parameters on your connection dialog. So as a connector developer, you need to think, what's the minimal amount of information that the user needs to provide to connect to my system? And does it make sense that those fields become the unique identifier for that credential? The different kinds that we support, uh, there's basically a singleton. A singleton means you have a single credential to connect to the system. There's no unique identifier. There's no server. There's no, nothing like that. It's just you always connect to the system. Or um, your backend, based on the user's identity, is able to redirect to the right place. So Facebook, Google Analytics are examples where you connect to Facebook, it's just a single credential. Uh, URL-based extensions have some special handling that I'll talk about on the next page, but those are really common. And then the final is custom. And custom just means it takes all of the required parameters on your connection dialog and turns those into a JSON string, and that becomes your unique key or your data source path for your data source. Um, if you have a URL type of data connector, there's a special, uh, special handling in the credential dialog. So you actually get prompted, uh, the user gets prompted, to select what path, what level of URL they wish to apply the credential at. Right? So by default, it's going to do the root. So for example, I'm connecting to SharePoint. Right? And so Microsoft, uh, Microsoft.SharePoint.com, I might connect to multiple team sites under there. If I say, apply my credential to the root, Microsoft.SharePoint.com, no matter what SharePoint site I access under that URL, it will always use the same credential. But maybe that's not what I want to do. Maybe I want to use a different user account, a test user account, to connect to another, um, to connect to various sites. Then I can select a more specific URL endpoint. It basically does a partial match of the URL or of the credential string, the path string, um, to determine whether the credential matches. This, this whole path and path matching is important to know because if the data source paths are different on a given credential, they are considered different data sources. And one of the things that Power Query does is when you're combining data between sources, it will warn you, it's called data firewall, it will warn you that data might be flowing from one side to another and it asks you to classify your data. And this can create uh, security issues, this can create a whole bunch of usability problems with your users as well. Um, but the key thing, the way we determine that two different data sources, the data source is different, is that the paths of the credential are different. So for example, if I'm using specific credential paths when connecting to SharePoint, 
I'll get the firewall prompt warning me that it's a different data source. If I use the same, if I use the root path on both of those data sources, it's considered the same data source and data, and data is freely combined between those paths. That's also important because one of the key, key benefits of using a custom connector is that you as the connector developer and data source developer, you understand how credentials will flow within your system and what defines a specific data source, a single data source. Um, if you've ever tried connecting to a, a REST API or a web API with uh, Power Query directly and you've had to do dynamic URL manipulation, you have to generate a new URL, you have to do paging and things like that, you'll find that it might work in desktop sometimes, uh, but in the service, it might fail because, because you're dynamically generating paths. The Power BI service doesn't know what credentials to use at a given evaluation, um, and it can cause some refresh issues. When you're using a custom connector, everything that happens internally to your connector is sort of hidden from the outside because it, it all inherits the same credential. Um, so even inside, for example, in Trippin, if I connected to my Trippin service as well as different OData discovery URLs, it would all count as a single data source. Okay, so from the Power Query perspective, it's just Trippin for the path of Trippin, and that's all I care about. You can, you're, freely, you're free to combine data sources within the connector. Um, don't call this out on the main slide, but yeah, this is one of the, this recently has come up in a number of customer calls uh, where they're trying to do complex web manipulation. A custom connector simplifies the scenario greatly. So great, let's switch over to Colin to talk about external connectors and deploy or external providers and deployment options. Thanks, Matt. Uh, great demos, as always. Uh, so external providers are going to be things that your customers have to install to run your connector. So like Matt said, uh, a lot of the connectors that we see are against REST APIs or uh, OData feeds. Um, but the next one that we see that's really common is ODBC. So um, there are a number of connectors that you can build that there wraps ODBC, ADO.NET, or OADB functions. And as of today, there's no way to package up those providers with the connector. So your customer is going to have to install that separately. Uh, of these, ODBC is the one that we'd recommend using. Uh, because ODBC kind of in the, the spec has a default contract with SQL, you're going to actually get a lot more functionality directly out of it than you would get out of ADO.NET or um, OADB. Some ones that come to mind, um, again, I've, I mentioned these earlier, but uh, Guidance BI Connector, uh, Dremio, Denodo, these are ones that our partners have built that we distribute that use ODBC. Um, ADO.NET is how you would get managed .NET code into your connector. Uh, this isn't something that we see partners do very often. Uh, I believe it's what CData does for a number of their uh, connectors they've built, and uh, also how we do R and Python connectors in Power BI. Finally, for completeness sake, uh, there's OLADB. Uh, I don't think there's a single partner who's built a heavily used OLADB connector, but you know it's there if you need to use it. OK, so how does Power BI load connectors? Well, uh, for custom connectors, it loads it out of the custom connectors folder, which is in your documents under Power BI Desktop. Uh, if it's an unsigned connector, which isn't a concept that we delineated before like a month and a half ago, uh, you had to lower security to be able to use that. However, something that I wrote a blog post announcing, I think is last month, is that we now have a signing tool. Uh, and this signing tool lets you take a certificate and it signs the connector with that certificate and it gives you a thumbprint. And then what you can do is you can provide that thumbprint to um, an IT admin or a power user and they will distribute it through the registry so that those connectors can be loaded securely in Power BI desktop without lowering security. So this means that um, say you are, I saw a lot of people who were in IT departments, uh, you could basically make a group policy and it would go into this secure area of the registry. It would say, I trust this thumbprint, and then you wouldn't have to ask your users to lower their security levels to load the custom connectors. I know this was a big sticking point for a lot of companies in, in building these. Um, so that's going to be how we kind of encourage you guys to uh, not have to worry about some of the requirements we have for certification and not have to go through Microsoft for stuff that doesn't meet those certification needs. Um, Support in powerbi.com comes through the gateway. 
And this isn't something that a lot of people think about, but besides just moving the data, the data gateway actually is another instantiation of the engine. So what happens is that when you're running um, these custom connectors through the service, it's reaching out to the gateway, and the gateway itself is evaluating those queries. It's the thing running the connector. So that's how you get support in the service. Uh, something, you know, it's, we call it out in our documentation, but you need to have a test connection uh, record in your um, connector to make sure that the service knows how to run those connectors. Uh, finally, we have a certification program available for ISVs um, that Matt and I run. We have a little bit of a backlog. If you guys have talked to me in the past, we are, you know, we're working on it. Um, this program is mostly if you think that you need to get it out to a lot of customers. Um, we have a nomination program. Uh, my personal suggestion is the person who is at the other end of that funnel is that if you have something critical like a Microsoft strategic deal or uh, some really big companies that you're trying to get it out to that have a lot of seats to go through your Microsoft, um, your partner representative or those companies' partner representatives, that's the best way to get it, you know, kind of through the queue. Um, just to be completely realistic about like how much time it takes to do each of these, because we do security review the code and make sure that it's going to work and be forward compatible and all that stuff. So why all of these different layers? Well, when you're working in Power BI, the custom connector is sitting in Power BI desktop in that folder, and it's being run locally, and there's basically nothing being executed against our servers. Uh, and that works both for accessing your on-premise sources, because presumably the computer on can see it, but also the cloud sources. But when you push that data to the service, it doesn't take the connector with it. To refresh data, you need to be able to execute that code over again. And as Matt showed you, there's a lot of things that you can do with those credentials. You can make arbitrary web calls, all sorts of things. So unless that we've looked at that code, we don't let you take those connectors and put them in the service because we don't want you running arbitrary credentials, authentication, taking inputs and stuff in our service. Um, so what that means is that you, ha you have your customers install the uh, gateway, which they're going to have to be doing for really any big enterprise deployment of the Power Platform in the first place, and it will run it. So you know, if you want to put it on those, those um, gateways, then you can do it that way. So let me talk a little bit about what certification involves and the steps involved. These are also our best practices for development in general, so even if you don't end up certifying it, um, you should probably go look at the certification page because we really encourage following that. Any future tooling that we do for validation, distribution in, in stores, stuff like that, we'll be working off some of these same certification requirements. So certified connectors are developed and maintained by you uh, and then reviewed and deployed by us. Um, this means that your service can get exposure and adoption um, if you have a lot of customers as opposed to just a few that want this. Um, then it's a lot easier to update them than through a file share. Uh, the connectors work out of the box, uh, and it will allow them to more easily build things like templates and dashboards and all that. Uh, realistically, I think saying a couple days on here is optimistic. Um, that's like per connector. So. Uh, so far, we've delivered, I think, 28, something like 28 certified connectors since October. Um, there's been a number of very valuable partners have built these connectors. And it's frankly um, been really nice because when you own the connector, you can update the connector. When you update your API, you don't have to wait a year and a half for us to figure out, hey, maybe we should add this functionality to the connector API. There's, I think, 108 connectors in Power BI now. So alongside certification and the efforts we're doing to make that better, uh, we've delivered a lot of stuff in the last year. And I like to talk about that before I talk about what's coming. So uh, Matt, what is? So as of today, we are announcing that there is now a Power Query website. We now actually have like a customer-facing website that you can look at and uh, future blog posts scattered across all the products that we're integrated in, the books. Um, did you switch over there? Yeah, the books, uh, articles, um, eventually partners and solutions. You'll be able to go to one place and you'll be able to see all the stuff. Um, most importantly, 
although I think there's a couple more changes that are getting propagated, we now have a connectors page. And it will tell you what products all the connectors are in so that you don't have to go click through product by product and do a comparison. I know that was something that people had a lot of questions about. Um, and this will also be coming with a what's new uh, page. So you can see every month you'll be able to say, oh, these connectors surfaced in these products, et cetera. Okay, uh, PQ Docs. These came out last August. Hopefully you've all looked at them. Uh, I worked very hard on editing them. Uh, so these talk about primarily mostly how you build connectors. Matt wrote a ton of wonderful, wonderful tutorials that take you from your first, you know, reaching out to a raw REST API all the way up through basic folding. Um, there's samples for implementing against ODBC, um, how to do schemas, dynamic schemas. There's a ton of really great information there. Uh, and I would personally suggest that before you even start trying to make a connector yourself, you walk through the trip pin tutorial, regardless of if you're working with a web API or an ODBC, just to get familiar with all the concepts involved, like the schemas and stuff. And then if you're doing something more complicated, see if there's a relevant sample. Uh, like I mentioned, trusted third-party connectors uh, we released last month. And then finally, um, we are going to be trying to bring custom connector support to Power Query Online, hopefully by the end of the year, maybe early next year. Um, it will follow the same rules, which, which is to say that, um, that's kind of roadmap. It'll follow the same rules, which is to say that if it's not secured, you're probably gonna be running it through the gateway but you will be able to access those same data sources in Power Query Online. So that's um, Power Platform Data Flows, which we announced at Build, um, as well as hopefully Power BI Data Flows. So one of the things that's really important to me is to try to improve the development experience here. Um, I think that there's probably no team out there that actually plays with and builds connectors as much as our own team. So we really sympathize. Any issue that you guys like leave us a message about here, we're generally pretty aware that we need to work on it because we end up being the point of contact, the subject matter experts for all the teams inside Microsoft to help build these connectors. I think Matt's probably built more connectors than anybody else alive. Um, and I mean like probably two to three dozen by himself. Uh, so we have a lot of stuff that we really wanna bring you guys. Uh, what we're working on, uh, we have the SDK, uh, as he mentioned, we're trying to get out the update for 2019 so that you don't have to make config file changes yourself or anything like that. Um, we're working on a new SDK for Visual Studio Code. Um, this will make life a lot easier for us. It'll make a lot, a lot easier for some of you guys. Uh, in the very immediate term, if you are a database vendor who maybe you have your own query language or you wanna do pass-through queries, um, this could, technically be true under some web APIs, but it's not gonna be as common. Uh, we are bringing multi-line support for native queries. If you're a Kusto user, your life will also improve because, Azure data sorry, Azure Data Explorer. Uh, if, if you use that a lot, then your life will also improve because you're gonna have more than a single line of input text now. Um, we're working to bring function and transform extension support to Power BI as well. So something that we hear from vendors is, okay, I don't have like a data source I wanna connect to, I just wanna provide this library of transforms. Maybe it's like um, mathematical transforms, maybe it's complex table level operations. I don't want them to authenticate, I just wanna be able to give this way to you know, improve my analyst's capabilities and package it up a single bundle. It's coming. That's, that's actually all gonna, that's all on its way. Um, we're, we're working on bringing some of the AI Insights stuff that's in service, and then we're gonna surface it in those same interfaces. Um, support and deployment, we are working on, which I think we've said for the last couple of years, we're working on bringing in store integration. Um, my goal is to make it so that both organizations that are delivering content internally and uh, consultants and ISVs delivering for their own product will have a full end-to-end -end self service story that you don't have to involve us whatsoever unless you wanna like do some kind of big partnership branding. That's my goal. I hope to have more information on what the timeline is like that later this year. Um, I don't have a date yet, but I can promise that it's just as important to us that we get to the point where you guys can self-service through all those normal Microsoft channels as it is to you guys. 
Uh, finally, and I think this is part that's most exciting, uh, over the next year or so, we do think that we're going to start to see custom connector support show up in Excel and, as I said, Power Query Online. Um, so part of this, is we are in partnership with those teams to make sure that those capabilities show up. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know the exact details on certified and versus just custom and like what order all the security stuff's showing up, but it is our goal that anywhere where you're seeing the M engine executing code will eventually see custom connectors. So we want to make sure that any investment you make just keeps accruing value without you having to do anything extra. Finally, we have a lot of resources. Um, we now have, as I mentioned, powerquery.microsoft.com, which will kind of become the resource hub, pointing at um, documentation, the M documentation, books like um, M is for Data Monkey, um, any other new books. If you've written a book, please send us an email and we'll try to get it up there. Blog posts, consultants, all that stuff, and it will be the home of Power Query content for Microsoft. Uh, so that's more or less the end of our session. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed it, learned something, uh, have questions that I can hopefully answer. Um, and I'll take those in a second. And like I said, I'll be at Totem 1 from 4 to 6 uh, data integration booth in the Expo Hall. Uh, after this, we have a number of other sessions. At 2.15, there's Power BI Common Data Model. 3.30, uh, we have the Power Query session. Are you doing that session? Yep, I'll so, be there. So Matt will be doing that session if you want more common use cases, uh, and then a number of other sessions tomorrow.